This is the Construction Leading Edge podcast from ConstructionLeadingEdge.com and BuilderMasterclass.com. My name is Todd DeWalt, and it's my job to help you, the business owner, the construction leader, eliminate chaos and maximize profits in your business and on your projects. This episode is an interview with Kristen Larson. She is the CEO of Southwest Electric, a Los Angeles commercial electrical contractor that's been in business for over 40 years. And here's what you're going to get out of this episode. You'll learn what Kristen's top priorities as a CEO are. The keys to growing from a 10-employee company to 50 and the failure cycle that she had to stop. You're going to learn about the handful of things on her financial dashboard that she uses to keep tabs on her business, a mindset shift that is common to most successful construction business owners, how Southwest Electric uses games to achieve targets in their business. She talks about one of the keys to running a successful family business is communicating to a resolution which is pretty good stuff. And then you'll learn about the system that they use for managing projects and maintenance work and a situation where they made a mistake with a client and how total honesty helped them to deal with that and what culture, what their company culture looks like on a day-to-day basis. A lot of great stuff here. You're going to enjoy this interview with Kristen Larson from Southwest Electric. Before we get into it, I have a couple of resources I want to share with you. All right, let's talk about a form of chaos I know you've experienced before, a bad customer review. Did you know it only takes one negative review to stop a potential job in its tracks? Your reputation takes years to build. Don't let one review change that. From Yelp to Google to Facebook, GoSight helps you manage and generate reviews all in one easy-to-use place. Research shows your customers need to see at least 30 positive reviews in order to trust your brand, and top-ranking businesses on Google have an average of 40 reviews. So a job well done and a happy customer aren't just revenue, they're marketing opportunities. GoSight makes it easy to build your credibility and authority as a construction leader by automatically asking your already happy customers for a new review with just one click. Take control of your customer reviews and turn your five-star success into more revenue with GoSight's easy-to-use mobile app. Get started for free at gosite.com forward slash podcast. That's G-O-S-I-T-E dot com forward slash podcast. If you are a project manager or a superintendent on a large construction project, you know how time-consuming it can be to collect information from your field teams and subs for the all-important daily report. Many PMs and superintendents spend hours a day chasing their teams for manpower logs, safety observations, and more. Then once you collect the information, you have to sit down at your desk or in your truck, manually enter the data into your project management system. Then if you have questions or if something's missing, you have to send text messages or emails or make calls. And then when you put this all together, it gets pretty chaotic. If that sounds like you, I'm here to tell you there's a better way. Field Chat is purpose-built to help you communicate and collect important information from your field teams and subcontractors. With Field Chat, You don't have to chase people down for visitor sign-ins, COVID assessments, safety orientations, toolbox talks, RFIs, safety observations, JHAs, hot work permits, manpower logs, and a lot more. Field Chat will chase everyone for you by using scheduled text messages or QR codes around the job site to collect the information you need. And because your field crews and subs already know how to use text and QR codes, they won't have anything new to download or learn. And if you have questions or need to send updates, you can use Field Chat to communicate with everyone via SMS text, all from one organized and searchable app. All of the data is auto-synced with your project management tools like Procore and PlanGrid, helping to save you hours a day and improving your documentation, keeping your company protected and your owners happy. Start your free trial today over at fieldchat.com forward slash edge and see how it feels to eliminate paper, data entry, and communication chaos on your projects. That's fieldchat.com forward slash edge. All right, now let's get into my interview with Kristen Larson from Southwest Electric. Enjoy. 
Kristen, thanks so much for being on the podcast. Uh, how are you doing today? Good. How are you? Excellent. All right. So we'll jump into my first question, and then we'll talk a little bit about your company and the type of work you do and, and your role. But the first question will actually be a pretty good indica indication of your role. And the, that question is, what is one thing you believed to be true about being CEO that you were surprised to find out was not, in fact, true? Sure. So I think it was mainly that uh, the CEO role does seem like it could be a glamorous role. It seems like it could be something that's like, oh, wow, when you make it to be a CEO, you know, it's like you're obviously not like in the trenches day to day doing all the things that, you know, um, everyone else is doing. But, you know, it definitely you realize once you get into it that you're still still to some degree doing that. Like, you know, you have to still get in there and there's a lot of work to be had. There's a lot to do. There's, a you know, it's it's, you know, probably more more stressful than you um it was before like whatever your role was before because you now have an entire company that you are responsible for so I, I think that was the biggest thing is just thinking that there was some kind of glamour to it when realizing it's really just you know another type of job <laughs> that comes with all the things that all jobs can come with so that was the biggest thing for me I think so it's not a, uh, it's not like you've arrived and it's a reward. It sounds like it's here you go. Here's more responsibility and, and, and more right. stress. Yeah. And I think you, you know, that is, you know, from a lot of people I have learned from, you continue to find out that, you know, people have goals and people have dreams and they want this or they want that. And it is about, you know, getting there and having those successes throughout, but you're always going to, to the next thing. You're never you're never like, yeah, you never do arrive. You're not like, cool, I'm here. And that was where I needed to get to. And now there you go. It's like, no, it keeps going. You're gonna always have that next thing that you're going for. And, you know, as a, as a CEO of a company, it's like, you know, we're growing, things are happening and there's always that next level back, you know, 10 years ago, I couldn't imagine, I wasn't even thinking about the levels we're at now in terms of the amount of customers we're serving and the, the billing. Like I, I wouldn't even have I, those kind of goals and targets weren't even in my mind. And now it's like, you get there and it's not like, Oh good. I did it. Okay. We're done. It's like, no, there's more to be done. You know? Yeah. yeah. So tell us about your company. What's, what's the name of your company? What type of work do you do? And give us uh, an idea of the size and scale of your company, if you would. Sure. Um, so the company's name is Southwest Industrial Electric, and we are a, an industrial and commercial electrical contractor. We mainly work for businesses and we'll do everything from, you know, we're doing power installations where we're connecting factories, all their machines, their lighting, their HVAC. And we also have a whole area that does repairs. So we repair anything going wrong, including machinery. So if they have electrical problems with their machines, we'll go and we'll figure it out and get them, get them working. Um, so that's what we do. Uh, we, we have been around for over 40 years. Uh, the founder, Evan Malm, he's actually my uncle and it's a family business. Um, we have a little handful of people that are blood family that work here, um, but we consider everyone part of the family and we end up having a lot of families work here. So there are multiple siblings, uh, husband and wife, you know, a lot of different families work here, which is pretty cool. Um, and yeah, so yeah, that's, I, I might've missed what one of your questions was. Um, how many, how many employees do you have? And can you give us an idea of the, the, your annual revenue, if you don't mind sharing? Yeah. Um, we are at about, it's getting close. It's like between 50 and 60 at this point. Um, and we're, we're approaching around 10 million in, in revenue this year, probably going to be a good deal more than that, but, uh, that was last year. So, um, yeah. Got it. And what effect here we are in the, we're recording this in March, 2021 at the tail end of COVID, 
Um, What effect, if any, did COVID have on your business? Um, It definitely had an effect. Obviously, it had an effect on, I think, anyone, no matter what, you know, the actual hit was, whether, you know, obviously some people had it harder than others in terms of the effect. But, you know, the biggest effect was we definitely had a slow for a while. We, you know, we were able to continue our operations um, in terms of being an electrician. So, uh, you know, in the essential category. Um, So it was just, you know, some months where a lot of, you know, a lot of our clients were shut down. We probably had a half and half scenario where certain companies were essential and certain weren't. So, um, you know, projects definitely got, got stalled or put on pause, et cetera. And then obviously just in terms of all the protocols being put in um, and changing the way we operate to meet what needs to happen for the health and safety of everyone. So that was a big, a big thing. Um, now, now it's sort of, you know, it's been a year. So it's something that's just now part of the practice and part of the normal, just like safety is part of the normal. So, um, but in general, um, we still were able to, you know, once the, uh, you know, two to three months of, um, like everyone just sort of clamping down and not being sure what was going to happen, um, you know, certain essential projects got up and running and we were able to still, uh, do pretty well this year in terms of our work and, um, being able to help with some big projects. So, so it was pretty good in the end. Yeah. And what, um, what geographical markets do you serve? So we're in California. That's where our headquarters is based. Um, we are licensed in California, Nevada, and Arizona. So we do projects in all three, um, states and we're actually opening, uh, uh, a branch in Texas. Um, getting really close to having our license in Texas. So we're excited about that. Um, and we plan to continue to do that to uh, open more states and be able to serve more of our customers as a lot of our customers are national, international mm. companies. And we do get requests a lot to be able to service them. And so we're trying to continue to do what we can to be able to service them more. Got it. Um, one of the things that people are dealing with right now, which is directly or indirectly related to COVID would be material prices are increasing. They are skyrocketing in some places, whether it's lumber, concrete, copper, et cetera. How big of an issue is that for your business? And what what is your team doing to, to deal with that? You know, it hasn't it hasn't totally hit us yet in terms of being a big issue. Prices are definitely going up, but it's not, it hasn't been significant to like drive it to where it's like, oh, unaffordable to our customers or something like that. You know, we, we definitely try to create great vendor partnerships so that we have, you know, multiple people in the different areas of material that we need to work with so that we can, you know, try to buy in quantity, do certain things that will allow us to get better pricing. Um, so that then we can pass that on to our customers and not have it create a big hit for them, you know? So um, that's the main thing is we do have departments that take the time to create those relationships, really price out our material workout. Are there deals we can get with quantity? Um, how do we, how do we do this so that we can still be competitive to our customers? Got it. Got it. Okay, here's one of my favorite questions. Makes yeah. some people a little uncomfortable, and here it is: How wow. has a a failure or apparent failure or just a setback set you up later for success? And and I actually did a an event. I called it FailCon about a year ago, <laughs> nice. and yeah. I invited three or four people I knew who were business owners to just come on and talk about their biggest failure. I talked about my biggest failure and we spent about an hour and a half sharing big failures with other people um, so that other people can learn from our mistakes. And so I'm, I'm curious, do you have a a favorite failure story? Well, with this business, um, there's a bit of a pattern of failures that was occurring for some years. Um, and I can tell you about one, one time when this was happening. So basically, you know, we started out as a small electrical contracting company. We had, you know, it was my uncle and he was pretty much, you know, doing the sales, 
doing the leading the jobs. He was he was doing all of that. And then there were probably five electricians. And then it was myself and my aunt. Um, that was it. That was that was that's where we were at, like probably 10 years ago or something like that. So the constant failure was trying to run this company that would um we would sell things and it would it, and we'd start like working. Oh, we're doing great. Yeah. And then it would just it would just plummet and we would totally run out of work. Mm. And then we'd go back to selling, sell, 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 sell. And I think this is probably the normal thing that occurs with smaller contractors that are like they're the one doing most of everything. Is you get then you get busy with producing and then you don't do anything to sell, et cetera. Right. Um, so we would get to a point where literally we would have nothing coming in. We'd have five electricians out of work and it would just be like, do everything you can to sell. You know, we're all waiting. The phone rings. Someone asks for a service call and we're like, go, 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 go get out there. Help them as fast as you can. And we're all, it's just like with bated breath, the phone is ringing. Oh, someone needs something. (laughs) Yes. And it, it was the worst. I mean, it's, it's the work. I mean, because even with five people, you're like, these five people do not have work right now. They're not, you know, and it's just in the contracting industry, it's just like they're not working, they're not making money. And it's a horrible pressure. It stinks. So it was always a grueling time when that would occur. Um, and and I sort of wanted to solve that. I was like, how how do we make these dips less like what do we do and the obvious solution was you got to separate production and sales you can't have the same person doing it all it needs to we need to there needs to be someone always pushing always pushing the work always making it happen and someone else that's handling the work and you know that's a pretty i would think a pretty self-evident uh thing but we had to work to develop that and to make that happen and through that we're able to really set it up so it's like now it's like you know, there's still our seasons. We still have a little bit of like, oh, the beginning of the year is always a little slower in this industry due to um, a lot of the companies we're working for sort of regrouping, setting budgets, doing all that. But it's it's still like everyone's everyone's working. Maybe they have some days off here and there, but it's like there's still a lot of work to be had. You know, it's a much better situation and it's a lot it's a lot less stressful for sure. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. That roller coaster of, of between feast and famine, it's, it's definitely too common. Um, so it sounds like splitting up production that splitting up the get work from the do work was a key. And somebody was always focused on get work and somebody was just focused on do work makes a lot of sense because it's very, I've been in that situation and it's, it's tough. It's, it's tough to do both. Well, especially when one is, is really busy. Um, right. Also, it, from what I've seen, it's a tough transition to go from small business with 10 employees up to 30 employees. seems like when you, when the company triples in size, when it goes from three employees to 10, from 10 to 30, from 30, up to a hundred. Those are some really big, big transitions. What were, what were some of the biggest transition points in, in your business that you've seen, whether it, it was in um, the number of employees or volume or what were some of the big, big transition points looking back on it? Um, yeah, I think, I think we just like one of our biggest was sort of obviously you know, the size of project you can take on based on the number of electricians you have and the number of staff. Um, Just like you said, that's probably about accurate. We had a year that went from about 12 people to about 30 people. Um, And I think the biggest thing is keeping up with um, ensuring that everyone that you're bringing on, you know, learns what they're supposed to be doing gets into the routine and the systems and um, that you keep the same level of service. And, you know, like I used to be the person answering all the phone calls when customers called in, scheduling the work, I was doing all of it. And there were certain things I established in terms of the customer service, how I want it to be, how all the, a lot of these people were my friends and I loved talking to them on the phone. And it just, there was definitely a, a very, you know, um, 
good rapport with each other and all that. So you start getting in other people, the team, and you don't want to lose any of that. You want to make sure that it's all, that it stays. And that is like emulated throughout the organization. So I think that's a big point that, you know, you have to, when you, when you go to that next level, you have to really put attention on, you know, training and practicing and, and, and going and looking and making sure that, you know, what, how is this going? Is this going how it's supposed to go? Okay. Not really. Let's do some more practice of this. Let's get this person um, up to that same level Mm -hmm. that you need it to be so that, so that you continue those successful things that are occurring on why you're now getting more business to be able to expand, you know? So that was a big, a big point for us, I think. If you could go back to that year where you went from 12 to 30 employees and make one change to make things simpler or easier or smoother, what would you go back and do differently? Oh gosh, that's a great question. Hmm. (laughs) Let me think here. Um, I think I would probably just, it's almost like while I was doing it, I was learning <laughs> this point I'm sharing with you. Um, and there was probably more stumbling than needed to be in terms of things not going exactly how I wanted it to go or things not going right. So I wish I was a little bit more prepared with, you know, um, my training program with the way each person learned their position and, um, I feel like systems is just such a big thing for any company in terms of establishing them. However, that is for you, but, you know, ways that people can just get into it and go, this is how it goes. Boom, boom, boom. Um, So I would have probably put more, even more concentration on that to get that better for that expansion. If that makes sense. Yep. Absolutely. I, I'm a big systems guy. That's what I, I work with contractors to do, put systems in place. And that really is the difference between companies who stay small and companies who grow. I, I, I found that the ability to create systems that work without them, I, probably the biggest transition is going from, I'm a cog in the machine that every, right. that if it falls out, if the cog that is me falls out, this machine stops running making the transition out of the machine to I'm the person assembling the machine. That That's a huge transition and being able to separate yourself from it. it it's such a gap to jump and it's tough right. to do. And a lot of people, I think it's, it's a, it's the governor on growth. The right. ability to separate yourself from the machine and start start to put those systems in place. Right, and take uh, that take that outside view where you can be looking at it yes. and going, okay, oh, that's not going as quickly as it should go, or that's not you know, and fixing it. And and I always have a tendency to also just look out for where I get pulled into things or where I see something go wrong, and it went wrong because I know I would have caught it, I would have seen that if I was, if I was in it, but I wasn't. And so how that, and then, so now it's almost like a troubleshoot myself of like, what, so who doesn't know what, that that's not happening? How do I, I need to tweak the line and need to tweak the system there and get it so that I do not have to be there to notice that that that's not the way to do it, you know? Yeah. So yeah. it's, it's sort of fun. I like it. <laughs> yeah. I, I love creating systems. I, I was brought into a, a sewer rehabilitation company, but, almost you know, 10 years ago now. And it was similar. It, there were about 10 or 15 employees when I got there, lots and lots of chaos, um, all self-performed work. And it was a, it was a disaster. And I, I learned how to build systems. I learned how, how to decide where to start, what systems to put in place, tried lots of stuff that didn't work. <laughs> um, and ultimately grew that company to about, we had 50 employees when I left and it was about $11 million in revenue. And it nice. was, it was a machine and it's, it's really nice to have a business that runs somewhat autonomously without you having to be in the middle of everything. Um, and- right. Cause then when you get there, now you're able to do what's, what I think is one of the funnest parts of the position is work on making it better, 
making it, you know, like now it's like cool or that next thing that you want to put in or some service or whatever, that's just going to strengthen the organization, grow it, et cetera, which is, which is what I love about my job. But you definitely, uh, I found a lot of people try to take on, take on that additional service, that additional geography before they have their base, base of operations locked down and they just create a disaster. And Mm -hmm. in many cases it implodes. So what I tell people is I like the vision. I like the spirit. I get it. You're an entrepreneur. You want to go, but you really have to put these systems in place, develop these muscles of the discipline of putting systems in place, get it working well, then you can go to the next thing and fight through that boredom and shiny object syndrome that strikes so many people. <laughs> it is, that is very true. That is yeah. very true. I love it. All right. So um, you mentioned that you're in a family business, um, yeah. which can be tricky. I've worked inside family businesses. I grew up in a family business. Um, what are some of the, the keys to making a family business work well? I think number one is uh, good communication and communicating about things that are coming up uh, to a a resolution. Um, We actually do very well as a family business, which is great. I was actually recently at a conference where I was talking to some other people about family businesses and they were telling me some horror stories, but we've, we've been able to do pretty well, you know, not that everyone always agrees about everything, but um, I think the the solid thing is like, you know, go, you know, go take a walk together, talk it out till it's resolved. You know, I think that that is a big point is that we try to make sure that we're aligned on things. And if we're not, we just continue to talk about it. You don't let that stuff sit and get, get like, uh, you know, where you're not on the same page and one person thinks we should do A and someone else thinks we should do B. Um, you know, we, we keep going until there's agreements, you know? Um, so. Yeah, that's. I, I think that's like number one to have a solid alignment and solid, you know, because also for people working for um, a company that's a family business, you know, any of that like misalignment or if there is resentfulness or things where things, you know, everyone feels it, and um, it's not, you know, I'm sure it's not something that anyone wants to experience. So we really have, you know, over the years gotten it down in terms of making sure we are aligned so that that leadership and, you know, everyone's on the same page with what we're doing and we keep it, you know, upbeat and positive. And, you know, and again, like any of those kind of problems are like, we take it somewhere else, get it solved. It's not someone in the reception, you know, arguing about something or whatever, you know, we keep it off of the team's plate until it's handled, you know? Yeah. Yeah. That's, I like that. Um, how do you handle tiebreaker situations? If two people just feel very strongly about something, how do you, how do you decide? Gosh, that's a good question. Um, hmm. Rock, paper, yeah, scissors. Had a whole lot of that. I mean, we haven't had a whole lot of that, to be honest. I think, I think we somehow meet, you know, with some kind of, you know, someone thinks this is really important. Maybe the other person doesn't think it's as important, but is there some way to somehow do that, put that in a little bit in a way that everybody can agree on? Mm -hmm. So I think it's, there's never been like a clear, like totally opposed views Mm -hmm. and you got to decide one of them and no one's going anywhere. It just, it hasn't gone that way before, which is fortunate, I guess. Um, It's always been that we just keep, going till we figure out like some happy medium for everybody involved. Yeah. And it sounds like the key to that is core values, alignments, and a lot of leadership's family work together. Yeah. And we have like, you know, Evan, who's the founder, electoral contractor, um, there's certain things he established sort of from his own, like, okay, I'm going to be this electric contractor. I'm going to do this, that he established early on in terms of the kind of work he wants to do and what he wants to do and whatever. And that that's always been like, if you're joining this team, if you're going to be doing this, like that's sort of the guide to those certain things, you know, so that, that doesn't change. And if you are working here, you've agreed to that, you know? So when I signed on to work here, it's like, 
I was like, good. And I, and I, and we agree on a lot of things. So it works out because I was like, cool, this is great. I love this. I want to do this too. So, um, I think if we also have that always there, it, it helps, it helps solve, solve things to keep doing that. Yeah. Makes sense. What are your top two or three priorities as CEO? I would say number one is sort of what we already talked about a little bit, which is making sure that people on the team really know what their role is, what their position is, and how to do it successfully. Um, you know, I'm not necessarily directly doing that with every person here, but you know, working with the leadership to have people um, ensure that they're getting there. Because you know, if each person is individually able to do well in, in their position. Um, that just translates to good customer service, to getting good products for our customers, et cetera. And for team members being excited to come to work every day, do their job well, grow, and um, it just works out. It's a, it's a good thing for everyone, basically. So that would be number one. Um, number, and I guess part of number one is then making sure that 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 translates to good customer experience, good customer products. So I think that's the people that are doing it and the products and customer experience are probably sort of together um, as number one thing for me. And then number two is probably numbers, finance, knowing where we're at with everything um, and keeping track of you know our, um, our costs and our all, all that stuff and just making sure that we're a viable company and that we're, you know, um, doing well with that. Um, and then three, um, hmm, three is probably, well, you said two or three, right? I guess mm -hmm. I could throw in a three. <laughs> three sure. is probably just, you know, enhancing the systems, enhancing the lines of things, figuring out better ways to do stuff. Um, you know, we're, we're in that stage right now that we have enough people in the organization to do everything we need to do. And, and I'm at that point where it's, it's what you said. It's, it's verifying all our systems and lines are working properly, that there's an easy way to train people up that, that come in to our organization um, and really getting that so solidified. Because like I said, we're going to be opening a branch in Texas and that's sort of next move. And that will be later this year. So that's that's sort of that stage I'm at right now in terms of the company. Got it. I appreciate that. Um, you yeah. mentioned looking at the numbers and the financial aspect of it. That is that's a mystery to a lot of construction business owners. Um, and I've actually I'm working on putting together a some training on getting better at the financial side of it. And I'm curious, what are a couple of the the financial metrics or the things on your dashboard that you're really looking at the, the either the financial reports or some metric that you're, you're really honed in on that are indicative of the financial health of your organization. Sure. Um, so a big thing I'm always looking at is expenses versus our um, billing versus our gross income. Um, so Obviously, you want your billing and your gross income to be more than your expenses to be a you know a viable company. So that's probably number one in terms of overview of being able to see what's happening. Um, but you know, I'm also uh, like in our system that we use for running projects and running jobs. I'm always looking at each job in terms of costs of the resources, cost of material, um, uh, uh, margins. For that, and then a certain amount's going into the overhead bucket, right? So we have, you know, this is our overhead. We got to cover this overhead. So each job a little bit goes into that overhead bucket. So I can sort of see the, you know, that and the net profit on each job. So I'm, I'm actually looking at that, you know, on a weekly basis, looking at the jobs that completed and how they're doing with that, and then the overall, you know, look of the expenses versus the billing and gross income. And then, and then I'm dialing in even farther to understand each area and like, good, what's a cost? What's our cost for um, sales and marketing? Great. And then how much are we bringing in? How many estimate requests are we bringing in? How many job requests are we bringing in? And how much are we selling? And being able to also just make comparisons to see, are we doing better? Are we doing worse? 
you know, we hired a bunch of people, yet we're not producing at the proportional level we should um, for those people that we added on. So it's, you know, those are those are some of the main points, I guess, in terms of the numbers and and what I want to know to make sure I then can, you know, pull a string, figure out like why if it's not how it should be, or even if it's really good. Wow, this is really good. Why is it really good? So I can reinforce that, you know? Yeah, definitely. I, that's a good point. So many times we audit things for the negative. And the only thing the people on our team hear about is what's going wrong here? Why is this going wrong? And yeah. it's it's probably as helpful, maybe more beneficial to go say, hey, this went really well. Good job. Let's talk about yeah. how we did this so we can do it again. Tell us how. How did you... How'd you do this? You know, what, what did <laughs> yeah. you figure out? Yeah. Yeah. Um, one last question on the, the financials. What system do you use to track all your projects? It's called Simpro. Oh, okay. So this, I don't know if you've heard of it. it I have. Oh, good. Yeah. We started using it um, almost two years ago. Um, before that, we were like paper. <laughs> it was long overdue in terms of, but I'd had trouble finding a software program that did everything we needed because we're um, not only service call based, but we have large projects that go on for months and months and months with a lot of people. And I found that a lot of programs were more geared towards the service call based um, contractors. And so that was my biggest problem. We wanted to project scheduling. We wanted to be able to see what was happening on large projects. So uh, yeah, so Simpro is what we use. Um, it was made actually by an electrical contractor It's from Australia, but it's been really helpful to our processes and we really like it. So cool. Yeah. Well, I appreciate you sharing that. Okay. What? Well, there's, I think we're in March. So recently in March, it was Women in Construction Week. Um, yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah, right. you didn't know. I did. Didn't, didn't I, did, no, I, did. I, I I'm part of the National Association of Women in Construction. So okay, yeah. So let's talk about some advice you would give to a woman in our industry who wants to move up into the CEO role. Sure. Um, I think the biggest thing is just to learn as much as you possibly can um, about your industry, about the the technical aspect of your industry. Um, you know, I'm not, you know, someone that's going to go out and do the installations myself, but I, I sort of have all the tech behind how we do it, you know, like more of a, almost an in engineering mind in terms of, oh, okay, someone needs to install this machine. How would I do that? And I could lay out how a job's going to go, all of that, right? So to, I think to be able to run any company, you have to know as much as you can about the product and services that you are doing. You should be able to answer most questions about how you would do that or how we would solve that, et cetera. So learn as much as you can about the industry. It doesn't mean you have to be able to actually get out there. Although at times I used to bend conduit and do that. I haven't done it in a while. So don't ask me to do it now. But um, you know, knowing as much as you can about that. And then obviously learn as much about the job you're doing now, whatever that is, get really, really good at it to the point where, you know, you're ready for a bigger thing. You know, that's, that's really how I did it was just learn everything you possibly can be curious, be interested, interested, ask questions, um, pick people's brains, you know, our, our lead specialty technician, Doug Crosby, he, you know, I would sit there for an hour sometimes asking him all kinds of questions about, the machines he was fixing and what does this mean and what does that mean and just be really curious and then you know that will you know your value will show to that oh wow you're taking on your role you know everything about it you're doing it really well where it's like people leaders are looking for that leaders are looking for other people to show that they're taking they fully are taking responsibility for their own position and more and like totally have it under control and are at that point where they could do more because they, we always need people, you know, more people to help in those leadership roles. So that would be that'd be what I say to to get there. Yeah, you brought up a good point. Um, I think a lot of people have a misconception that in order to to be a leader, you have to be able to do what the people on your team do, whether that's electrical, plumbing, 
concrete, et cetera. And what I found is that the doing and the leading are two very different skill sets. And yes. you don't necessarily you don't necessarily have to know how to do it to be able to lead it. And I think one of the misconceptions in our industry is that if you can do it really well, that means you can be a good leader. So just because right. you're a good electrician, that doesn't mean you can be a good superintendent because those are two very different skill sets. And yeah. my advice to people is very similar to what you said, go learn it. But then the the leader mindset, the whether you want to be a project manager, project executive, business development, the CEO, have a, a problem solving mindset. Go look for the problems, go solve those problems for customers, for your people. And that's it's like a being able to, to deal with difficult situations, confront people, um, solve problems. Those are superpowers in, in, yeah. in business today. So focus on, yeah, learn those things, find the problems, figure out how to solve problems. And your leadership will recognize it or somebody will, and uh, you will, you'll definitely move up to the top. Agreed. So this could be a little controversial, um, but this is a term I hear so many times when when I, I read about or interview women in construction, construction is a male dominated industry. End quote. Sure. <laughs> how do you, how do you feel about that? Yeah. I mean, obviously it, there are a lot more men in construction than women. That is, that is for sure. And, you know, I do, I do think that um, that's just sort of the history of it in terms of what, uh, how things have gone is that, you know, from back in the day when, you know, people, men would go out and they'd build the things, you know, and obviously the world has changed a lot and women are able to do, are not just at home and are able to go out and work. And, um, I love seeing women, you know, I, we have a lot of women that work for our company and it's mainly in administrative roles. Although there's a lot of women that are super interested in learning about what electricians are doing in the field. So, um, you'll see the other day, Grace on our social media was, you know, she's on one of our courses that's, you know, where she's sitting there, you know, dealing with panels and, and getting in there. And, and that's, that's really exciting to see, but, um, you know, I, I've been in this industry for now for more than 15 years. When I first started out, I did feel like probably other than my aunt, like, I don't think I'd see a woman around really ever. <laughs> it was always men. <laughs> And it's a lot has changed. I, I, there are a lot more women that we deal with in terms of our, of our customers and the contacts, um, in terms of with other vendors, with you know. So it's fun to see that. I've never really taken it as anything than okay, this is how it is, and like I'm I'm going to do my own little part in recruiting and inspiring more women to be part of it because I think it's fun and I um, and I like it a lot. So you know, we've definitely done that here within our company. Um, and I like to be part of things like women, uh, the association of women in construction, just because it's, it's fun to unite with those people and just keep spreading the word that it's cool. It's fun for women. It's cool for women to be in construction. Like, let's do this. Let's be a part of it. What, um, for someone, for a, a woman in construction who's not familiar with the National Association of Women in Construction, what would you tell them is the best benefit? What's what's the best thing about being in that organization or some other organization for women specific to construction? I think it's. I think the main thing is just your connections and your ability to to um, have that group. You know, that's part like be part of something bigger in terms of that, you know, in terms of this industry. And, uh, I was just part of a, you know, a cool little, um, benefit for kids that was put on and I got to, uh, be part of the judging, um, they're building things out of Legos and different stuff and competing, um, it was sort of just to shed more light for kids on con the, the careers in construction. And, um, it was, it was a really cool thing and a fun thing to be a part of. And I, I think just being able to uh, align ourselves, um, even though we're all working in different places, on different roles, um, finding out more about what everyone else is doing, what they're running into and supporting each other is, is a pretty cool benefit. 
Yeah, the construction industry is so fragmented already, but it's even more more so for construction business owners and CEOs. They're very they're isolated. If they're a lot of the people I work with have expressed if they're when they're being honest that I don't have anybody to talk to or the the only person I can talk to who knows what I'm dealing with is my competitor and I can't really yeah. go talk to them about like hey what are you doing about your this supplier or this subcontractor yeah and um so there's a, a tremendous benefit to being part of a group having somebody to bounce ideas off having basically a a board of advisors who knows exactly what what you're dealing with. Yeah, definitely. Right. Agreed. So, here's another one of my favorite questions. Um, what is something you believe to be true about business that might that some might think is a little unconventional, maybe even crazy? So, I would say like being totally honest with your clients. Um, to even the point of of when you make a mistake or you make an error, um, you know we uh, there was a situation where we we build a customer and then in going through some kind of audit we discovered we had billed the customer the full amount of the project even though part of that project didn't end up getting done and it was just a mistake in paperwork that someone missed oh wait we didn't do that part. And, you know, I think most of the, oh, okay, the customer never said anything. It was paid. It was months ago at that point. You know, a lot of people might go, okay, well, oops. Okay, moving on. Well, we got an extra three grand out of that. Um, but no, we, we called the customer. We let them know of the error and that we were going to give them a full credit and apologized for it. And they were <laughs> mind blown. It was so weird <laughs> that someone would be doing that. and. You know, it's one of those things where, you know, it, it some people will be like, oh, I don't want to, I don't want to let them know I screwed up, you know, but by, by doing so, it just earns that trust. It's like, we are comp like, when we say we're honest and we're good contractors, we really are <laughs> to the point that we will do that. It, it, like we have an internal, you know, thing telling us like, we're not going to rip off our customers. We're not going to, and it, we can't sit with it. You know, we can't look at that and know what happened and be like, okay, well, it's fine. So we have to, that's how honest we are. Um, and so, yeah, I would, I would say that's a, a big one that most people would think was a little odd to do it that way. Yeah. Yeah. I've found um, that when there's a mistake or something has gone wrong, the tendency is to try to hide it or avoid the customer. But in reality, what I've found is that those are opportunities to really solidify the relationship because it's already happened. The mistakes has happened. Right. Um, if they know about it, especially the worst thing you can do is try to avoid it. So I've, I've been through enough cycles of this where when something goes wrong, my response is, all right, this is going to be good because we're going to respond to this the right way. We're going to walk out of this thing with a better relationship because yeah. like in that situation, if somebody came to you and said, Hey, you didn't catch this. We messed up. We're going to write you a check back. Um, that, that says they're trustworthy and right. they're going to take, take good care of me. And that has always worked out. Right. It's always great. You can't go wrong. You can't go wrong doing the right thing. And that's, yeah, that's, that's probably on a, an Instagram card somewhere, but, uh, yeah. it, it's very true, very true in business. Yeah. Yeah. So it sounds like company culture is a big deal. Just in the research I've done on your company, it seems like company culture is a big deal. And most people would say company culture is important, but I'm curious, what does, what does that look like? How does the importance of company culture show up in your day-to-day -day operations? Um, I think it's basically just the spirit and way that each person here um, interacts, deals with each other as well as our customers. Um, we definitely have a fun mentality. We have a you know positive mentality. Um, we try to integrate games wherever we can to make things even more fun in terms of target setting or um, we want to get something done. 
let's go for it. And, you know, having some kind of reward for that hard work. Um, so it's sort of just throughout all of our, you know, interactions and our day-to-day process in terms of talking about what we're trying to achieve. Um, and yeah, it sort of goes like the leaders, you know, in the company sort of carry it to everyone else when you, when people are even interviewed, you know, we make sure to communicate, like we're looking for people that are into the, into playing a game with us into, you know, making a career out of it and joining on to something that is basically like a game to be the the best in our, in our um, sector, to be able to bring this to more and more customers um, by being this way. And I think it comes through to our customers too, because everyone sort of has that mentality. I think our customers appreci- appreciate calling in and talking to whoever that person is that they know because we bring that to them too. We bring that positivity, that, you know, figuring out the solutions that we're going to get this done. We're going to figure this out mentality to them as well, which we get calls for things that have nothing to do with electrical contracting just to solve our customers' problems. You know, they're like, oh, we'll just call Southwest. They'll figure this out and we'll go, okay, what's the problem? Okay, let's see. You know, sometimes it's like a little odd. We're like, Okay, how can we help them? But we're always trying to figure out how could we help them? They're, you know, at least get them in the right direction or, you know, if we can't do it ourselves. But, um, you know, it, it it comes through to them. It comes through to everyone on the team and it makes it a fun, fun place to work. Yeah. Yeah. That reminds me of a story I heard about Zappos, the online shoe retailer. Yeah. Um, they had such a customer service mentality that they were basically told to do whatever the customer asked. So somebody took it upon themselves to push the limits. So they would call Zappos and say, hey, can you order a pizza for me? And they would do it. And nothing to do with their business, but they they (laughs) figured out the inner workings of Zappos customer service. And they would literally do anything for their customers. It was not suggesting that we order pizzas. I love that. I love it. Hey, I want to go back. I'll, to I'll, spread, I'll take that nugget to the team. We'll we'll see what we can do. You may want to create a little budget for <laughs> flowers and pizza and you know stuff like that. Yeah, um, like you that. mentioned games and target setting. Can you give us an example of just a recent game, or maybe it's a current game that that's going on and what that actually looks like in real life? Yeah, so it was different a year and a half ago in terms of our games because the world was a different place. Um, now we've had to, you know, change it a bit for the the current way it is. But um, we have ongoing games like you know in our production area in terms of um, basically like you know their main thing that we're tracking for production is when they're completing jobs, we're able to build jobs. And obviously the larger jobs are handling and finishing it's billing. So it's basically our, our billing is the main thing that they um, are going for. So we'll set targets for, you know, with this many people that we have on the team, you know, we want to get this done in this quarter. Um, And basically it would just be like, you know, we do updates throughout the quarter where we're at, and um, most quarters were able to win win the game. It's it's usually like maybe one out of one out of four. Sometimes doesn't totally get there, but um, it used to be we would do like team parties. So meaning we would we would go to the bowling alley, or we would go you know, or we'd have a, a company uh, party at you know one of the executives' houses, or we would. Um, we back in the day we used to go to I picked movie theater, which is like a cool movie theater. You get your seat and your your uh, your blanket and your popcorn and all that, and people would have a certain amount of budget for food and drinks. And um, now it's more like we get lunch for everybody. Everyone gets a gift card. You know, um, there's different uh, um, smaller team things where they'll you know have lunch you know, as best they can, if it's like, you know, cause we have smaller sales teams and stuff where they have their own goals for, so I, we leave it a little bit up to the leaders of that area to create the games, you know, um, for each thing. So they're changed, but those are some of the, the bigger ones that happen. Yeah. I like it. So what's, 
for people who are listening to this thinking, why in the world would I ever do this? That I, I don't get the gamification of a construction business. What are they, what are they missing out on? What's, what is it, what has it done for your company? I think that a big thing is, you know, um, for me, I, I participated in like a side business a, a long time ago at this point, And I went to a conference and I think, um, you sort of find that most people want to be part of something that where they feel like it's theirs, you know, that there's a contribution that, you know, that's why a lot of people want to be business owners or find these ways to go do whatever they're going to do. Um, but it's not, not, not everyone's going to be able to be a business owner. It's, it's not necessarily the easiest thing or, or, you know, start a business. That's, that's a tough thing to do. Um, but by by creating a game, by create making everyone a part of it, because it truly it's true. Every single person in an organization is part of it. You know, you need everyone from reception answering the phones really well and routing your customers quickly and properly to you know the person in finance paying our vendor bills. Like everyone has a role that makes this company work. So figuring out ways to make everyone part of something that is what are we trying to get done and setting actual targets for that, depending on what your product is. Um, It just, it, it, it ends up having more success. I think, I think that it creates more success because everyone is a part of it. Um, If you're just sort of doing your own thing and, you know, people are working for you and that's how it's going. It's like, I'm sure you can still, get things done. I'm sure you still could be successful. I don't think it's as fun. And I don't, and I think you will only help your success by implementing it and making everyone a part of what you're doing. Good stuff. I love that approach. Well, I want to be um, cognizant of your time. We've covered a lot of great stuff here. Um, Do you have any questions for me that I might be able to answer for you? Yeah. Um, Well, one, how long have you been doing podcasting? Seven years, almost, oh, wow. almost to the day. It was mid March, twenty fourteen, when I pushed publish on episode one. Wow! Yeah, that's incredible. So you've been doing this a lot longer than I mean, the real podcast, like it becoming super popular, seems to be in the last year or two. I feel like so you were sort of ahead of the curve. I feel like I was. Industry. Somebody called me the OG of construction podcast recently. I'm not sure how I feel about that, but um, <laughs> yeah, I was. I, I started. There were only uh, one or two others, maybe at the time. Yeah. Wow. And then I wanted to know more about. Um, you were saying that you help companies put systems in. So what what do you do exactly with that? Yeah. So it's a. Um, it starts with strategic planning. So I, I talk a lot about what I call right to left thinking, which is let's go out to the right side of the page, which could be 12 months from now, five years from now, retirement. And let's let's figure out, let's, I'm gonna, I'll force people to ask their, themselves the question, what do I want? What do I want? Most people struggle. They've never thought about it. They've just taken whatever life has thrown at them. But start with the question, what do I want? What does my lifestyle look like? How much do I want to work? What kind of people do I want to work with? What role do I want to have in the business? And then let's work right to left, work backwards from there. And then set some, maybe it's a 12 month target, but then come back to some short-term targets. What do we want to do? What are three things we really want to do, need to do in the next 90 days to, to get to where we want to be? And then I'll help them put systems in place, whether it's, um, sales processes, designing their organization to get to where they want to be. Um, I spent a day in Dallas, Texas with one of my clients, just meeting with his team and also designing his organization. What we decided where he wanted to be and then worked backwards from there and said, are this, these are the moves that we need to make. These are the hires that need to happen. Some of the things that need to happen with, within the team, um, and then it's, it's a lot of systems building. How do we, how do we drive our projects? Um, I've 
been in construction since about 97, spent most of my time managing large commercial projects and learned a lot about how do you preempt problems? Let's put systems in place to avoid problems. I I like to think of myself as a pretty good firefighter. You know, everybody likes yeah. to strap on the the hero cape and fly in and, and solve the problems, but it's a lot, it's a lot less sexy, but it's a lot more profitable to prevent these problems. So sure. let's put systems in place so the business runs kind of autonomously and um, the business owner can accomplish what they want. So it's my first question is, what do you want? And then let's work backwards from there and put systems and processes and people and solve the problems necessary to get there. And that's that's what I do in a nutshell. Great. That's awesome. And um, and out of all these podcasts you've done and obviously learning um, about businesses and then helping businesses, what would you say um, like the top three things are that you find are what is, you know, what people can do that are successful for them in terms of their business and growing and all of that. Yeah. The first one would be have the right mindset and really work on their mindset and, and shift from, I take whatever the world gives to me. And, uh, as, as I heard one author, he called it the, you need to have an, an internal locus of control. So many people have an external locus of control, which means that my attitude, my income, my relationships, my life is determined by something outside of me. Right. And that's how I used to be. And I had this aha moment probably six years ago, reading some stoic philosophy book, and it just changed everything. And I realized I get to decide. Right. I'm the problem. The problem's not out there. It's me. It's it's the way I think. It's the way I perceive things and the way I respond to things. And if I'll take control of of my mindset and the way I process information, if I can control the way I think, control my emotions, uh, then I can, you know, I'm I become unstoppable at that point. So that's that's number one, is is mindset. Um, I've worked with people who have had access to the best strategy, the best tools in the world, but they didn't have the right mindset and it just didn't work. Right. That makes so, sense. So that would be number one. And then second is the systems, systems thinking, shifting from I'm the, the cog in the middle of the machine and I have to be stuck in the machine to being elevated and, and slightly separated from it, looking down on the machine and designing the machine, being able to really being able to make that transition from being the cog in the machine, transitioning to the designer, that being able to make that jump successfully is, is really challenging. And my advice would be for people to design their business from the beginning to not be that cog, but so many people start off as the cog. So that would be the, the second one is their, their perspective of the, their relationship with their business as being the designer of that business. And then I think leadership, just being able to, the ability to understand how the human brain works um, communicate with people. I, I don't believe we can motivate people because I think people have all the, the motivation they need, but it's our job as leaders to help them articulate their motivation and find the motivation they have and then sh- answer the question. Everybody has this question. What's in it for me? Why would I do this? What's in it for me? And mm-hmm. when we can answer that question, then we get the best of, of people. That's when we see people take ownership, and they they're working for their own reasons and they're excited to be part of something bigger than themselves. And right. I've seen that. Uh, it, it's pretty amazing when people, when we can tap into the hearts and minds of people and lead them instead of just, just managing them. So those are, those are probably the big, the big three. Yeah. Those are all great. I love them. Yeah. I agree with them wholeheartedly. Well, that's good. <laughs> Obviously, you guys have figured that out because 
to be able to get to 50 employees, I, I think requires doing those things. It's like there's a built-in built-in limits that say you won't, you will never grow past a certain point until you get right. these things. They just they just tend to implode. So right, yeah. right. Well, That's good true. stuff. Well, th- this has been fantastic. Um, one last, well, before I I give you an opportunity to to tell people where they can go to, to follow you or connect with you. You have an audience of a few thousand construction business owners who have been listening for about an hour or so. So apparently they're incredibly intelligent, motivated world. They made it this far. So they're that's just, great. <laughs> and so what, uh, is there anything else that you'd like to share with, with, uh, with this group? I think I would like to just say that, you know, I do see more and more um, people like yourself with these podcasts and um, some others in the industry just pushing to, um, you know, one, unite the industry a bit more and and help sort of teach the things that will help people be successful. But um, also, you know, try to align the construction industry to sort of change it to what used to be the the way people would think of the construction industry and make it to be what a lot of it is which is you know great people doing great things and building our world i mean it really is we are we are the people that you know put the things in place that are needed for our world to survive so it it's a it's a pretty cool skill and a pretty cool thing that everyone is doing and i and i i think that the more um, contracting companies that implement the cultural things and the leadership things that um, you see in a lot of other industries that are known for that kind of thing. Um, it will just sort of, it will continue to then bring better people into the industry. We'll just make it better for everybody. Um, it will make it more of an attractive industry to be a part of. And um, I would love to get everyone's help in 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 doing that because I think we can, and I, I'd love to see ten years from now that construction is one of the 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 most attractive, best industries to get into from a you know from a view of the the average person you know. So, yeah. Good stuff. I like it. Well, if folks want to connect with you, apply for a job, follow you on social media. Where are some of the places they can do that? Yeah, so our uh, website is southwestelectric.com. So you can go there, southwestelectric.com, all spelled out. Um, we're on Instagram at Southwest Electric. Uh, and, you know, you'll find us the same way through um, LinkedIn. You know, we're everywhere you can find me, Kristen Larson, Southwest Industrial Electric on LinkedIn. And we can connect there. Yeah. Sounds great. I'll put those links in the show notes. Kristen, this has been fantastic. Thanks so much for being so generous with your time. Love what you're doing with your company. And um, let me know if there's anything I can do to help you in the future. Yeah, same. Thank you. This was great. I had a great time and I, I love what you're doing in the podcast and i um, excited to listen to more of your episodes and learn way more about it. Sounds great. Thanks, Kristen. If you're a project manager or a superintendent on a large construction project and you're tired of chasing people down for daily reports, safety orientations, JHAs, or toolbox talks, here's some good news. Field Chat will chase everyone down for you by using scheduled SMS text messages or QR codes around the job site to collect the information you need. Start your free trial today at fieldchat.com forward slash edge and see how it feels to eliminate paper, data entry, and communication chaos on your projects. That's fieldchat.com forward slash edge. All right, be sure to check out the show notes for the links so you can connect with Kristen. Reach out to her on LinkedIn or social media and tell her thanks for taking the time to be on the podcast. Um, I thought she shared a lot of great information and uh, it's going to be fun to watch Southwest Electric grow over the next few years and see what they do. Be sure to check out those resources that I mentioned earlier. One other thing, if you are interested in getting better at the financial side of the business, then go to buildermasterclass.com forward slash CFO. 
I'm putting the finishing touches on an in-depth training program to help you get better, to master the financial part of the business, but I need your help. I need to make sure I cover everything that needs to be in that course. And if you could go to that that link, buildermasterclass.com forward slash CFO and take a brief survey. I would really appreciate it. As always, I also appreciate the ratings and the reviews. If you could take a moment and leave a rating and a review on the podcast player of your choice and maybe share this podcast episode with somebody you think would get some value out of it, it would be great. It would mean a lot to me and it helps get the word out there as well. As always, my name is Todd DeWalt. If there's anything I could do for you, head over to uh, constructionleadingedge.com. If you want to schedule a call with me, if you're a construction business owner and you want some help mapping out a strategy, getting through some of the roadblocks that you're dealing with and just getting where you want to be, getting where you know your business should be and where you can take it, then go to constructionleadingedge.com. Click the button that says schedule a call and you and I will get on the phone and we'll talk about what help might look like, and we could talk about what it would look like to work together with me. Thanks so much for listening. My name is Todd DeWalt from ConstructionLeadingEdge.com and BuilderMasterclass.com. I'll see you next time. A happy customer isn't just revenue, it's a marketing opportunity. From Google to Yelp to Facebook, join the more than 30,000 small businesses already using GoSite to request respond, and manage reviews, all from one easy-to-use dashboard. GoSite puts the power back in the hands of you, the construction business owner with a mobile app that transforms how you run your business by making it easier for customers to find, book, pay, and review your services online. 